This recording brought to you by the University of Adelaide. In contrast to what you've been listening to, which has been very encyclopedic coverage, we'll now hear a journey on a very narrow path one particular area um, of radar and astronomy. But this is a story which I got involved with in 1949. For over 50 years, the work in this area was under my general direction. I'm pleased to see that the work is still continuing under Professors Reed and Vincent, and that Adelaide, is still a centre of excellence in meteor astronomy and in meteor studies of the dynamics of the upper atmosphere. First, <clears throat> what are meteors and where do they come from? And it's on the slide there. The commencement really is comets. Comets carry in them little particles, mixture of dust and sand. They evaporate near the sun, producing these groups of sand and dust particles, moving, of course, in the orbit of the original orbit of the comet. When these particles enter the Earth's atmosphere, a lot of them ablate, they burn up, and what you get then is a column of light and ionisation, which we call meteors. <clears throat> now, the size of these particles is close to what I'm going to pour out here. Beach sand. So, if you want to have any idea of these particles, just pick up a handful of beach sand whenever you're at the beach, and it'll remind you that these primitive particles, once trapped in comets, have about the same size distribution as beach sand. <clears throat> well, toward the end of the war, radars in England were endeavouring to detect ballistic missiles but they observed a large number of non-missile echoes that turned out to be echoes from meteor trails. An example is shown in the next slide, where we see a simple picture of a scattering from a long column of ionisation on the left there, which called, we call that transverse scattering. And on the right, that's the sort of signal that you got back um, from your radar systems. <clears throat> from about mid-1945, a small group, research group at Manchester University began studying meteors using ex-wartime radars. And they installed them at a university field station known as Jodrell Bank, about 30 kilometres south of Manchester. The leader of the group was a 30-year-old senior lecturer named Bernard Lovell. And here he is now. Now Sir Bernard Lovell, photographed on his 90th birthday in front of the large radio telescope that bears his name. In mid-1948, with the appointment of Huxley, a reader in physics at Birmingham, to the elder chair, Huxley looked at what possibilities there were for research in Adelaide. Now, Alice has already mentioned that. And he, <coughs> the third one that he chose was radar scattering of meteors, and that came about because he went and had a conversation just between his appointment and leaving England, he had a conversation uh, with Lovell about any area of radio astronomy that he might be interested in following through in Adelaide. 
and Lovell strongly advocated that Huxley initiate radar studies of meteors as the whole southern hemisphere was an open field for such work. And Huxley accepted Lovell's advice and soon after his arrival um, he opened this area and I remember the occasion very well. He, he spoke of the um, potential of radar meteor astronomy though he had no experience himself in the actual observation of meteors with radar. And I was intrigued by his talk and so I, in 1950 I commenced my PhD. So it's in retrospect it is to Bernard Lovell that the credit should go for persuading Huxley 64 years ago to establish at Adelaide a research group on the radar studies of meteors. Lovell died three weeks ago. He would have been 99 yesterday. <clears throat> in early 1950 I was joined by two honour students, Des Liddy and Alan Weiss, and three of us formed the first radio physics group. And then in 1991, as, <coughs> as Alice has mentioned, we were joined by David Robertson, who was a research scientist at Weapons Research Establishment and a gifted radio engineer and who had enrolled as a PhD student. It was at this stage that we made a very significant decision and changed our emphasis from meteor astronomy to measuring the drift of short-lived meteor trails in order to study winds in the atmosphere. So we acquired a, a surplus wartime radio transmitter, ad adapted it to generate a kilowatt of continuous wave transmissions, and we installed it in a small room on the second floor of the physics, old physics building. And as the building has a tiled roof, we constructed a, a very simple antenna system which we placed in the ceiling space above the transmitter. Receivers and recording equipment were installed in a building near Salisbury. And after a few months, David Robertson pointed out that we could determine the direction of arrival of echoes from meteor trails by recording signals on three spaced antenna. In the next slide is diagrammatically shown on the left there and in the lower part um, is a photograph of three of those antennas and if you've got very good vision you'll see in fact in the far distance the Adelaide Hills. This uh, meteor direction finding system was the forerunner for such systems now installed worldwide. Next slide. I'm not going to talk about the details of this record. It was one of the early ones that we had. Uh, other than to say, there are analog records. We had to read them all by hand, iron hand, and you'll see some marks in the centre traces there, which we had to, uh, in order to determine the position on the records we can compare one with, a, with the other adjacent one. It was many years before digitisation of the data allowed this operation to be made automatic. Early in 1952, Lovell, still interested in our work, offered to assist in setting up an independent radar system specifically designed to measure the properties of meteor showers. And Huxley suggested that we, shown in the next slide, very grainy slide, uh, go to Manchester and bring back some equipment for this purpose. Which he did toward the end of 1952 uh, with two receivers and recording equipment. He came back with some designs for a transmitter, an antenna, and virtually by himself built that equipment, 
with no electronic background whatsoever. Quite remarkable. Six years later, Weiss moved to Sydney to join the CSIR Solar Radio Group. By the time he left Adelaide, Weiss had discovered seven new meteor streams and produced a steady stream of publications. Weiss's lone astronomical work at Adelaide stands as a beacon in radar meteor astronomy in Australia. Now, we turn to our work that we were carrying out on winds. This commenced in June 1952, continued for about five years, and Robertson and I completed our PhD in the late 1950s. In early 1954, the Antarctic Division of the Department of External Affairs was seeking proposals for upper atmosphere studies in Antarctica. And I suggested that we build a meteor wind radar for installation at Mawson. The Antarctic Division agreed to fund the project. And one of our BSC, BSC graduates, Carl Nielsen, took the equipment to Mawson in December 56 and operated it there for a year. But due to problems with interference between the meteor radar and the communications equi equipment at the base, sadly the Mawson observations were somewhat limited. Back to Adelaide. At the beginning of 1955, I decided that we should commence the measurement of meteoroid speed, that is the speed uh, of entry of these very small particles. By then, uh, there was a colloquial name for them, the crumbs of creation. Because these particles had spent most of their life trapped in a comet until they were released as the comet went past the sun. And when they entered the atmosphere, it gave us the opportunity of me measuring some of their characteristics. So this is in 1955, five years after we started, I decided that we should try and measure the speed of these particles. Um, the, a technique had already been proposed by a group in uh, Ottawa in Canada. Um, so I suggested to uh, John Mainstone, who's here somewhere, uh, that uh, he was an honest physics graduate at the time, uh, that he look at this project. And in order to see the very com early commencement of the echo that we got, which contained the information that we needed to get the speeds, uh, he developed a magnetic tape system to record and replay with a delay of about two seconds. And I wish to pay uh, a tribute to uh, John's contribution to this very special area of meteor astronomy. And the next slide shows <coughs> the distribution of speeds that John observed the first distribution that I know of in that time. They were the first, of course, observation in the southern hemisphere, but they were superior in measurement of any observations anywhere. So at that time, Adelaide was preeminent in the precise measurements of the Meteoroid speeds, a position that has continued to the present day. In January 1957, I decided that we should set up a multi-station system to measure meteor orbits. In 1958, the system was installed at a new field station at St Kilda, about 22 kilometres north of Adelaide. And that station continued to operate for about 20 years. The next slide shows diagrammatically um, 
the system with two supplementary um, receiving sites, the east and the north of the main station. And again, uh, to record the data, we, we used John's technique of recording on magnetic cape and replaying two seconds later. The first person to work on the orbit uh, measurements was Carl Nielsen. He measured over 2,000 orbits and the next slide shows that when he looked at them they naturally grouped themselves into meteor streams. And these are the streams which uh, he observed. They all close to the plane of the ecliptic, so you can just draw them like that. Now, if we, next slide, we're returning to that picture already had up. And just if you look, cast your eye along the meteor trails, you'll see that you can identify three points. And in fact, what we were interested in, in addition to the orbit work, whether we could extract from the motion of the trail at these three points information about the turbulence of the atmosphere. You would expect, in fact, the speeds of these three to be, to be different, and they are. Um, and this work was carried out, next slide, um, carried out by Bob Roper, and there's his in 1962, showing how the energy um, of dissipation of turbulent eddies um, varies during the course of the year. This is all uh, pioneer work, that, in particular that one. Now the story of any long research program will, in retrospect, show moments of lost opportunity. In 1965, Elizabeth Doyle commenced a PhD program on the observation of winds, and in 67 she observed a curious reversal in the wind. Next slide. Um, from north to south and vice versa uh, on alternate days. And you can see on the bottom traces there uh, a reversal of the meridional wind, north to south wind, over two days. Well, we con she continued to observe, it disappeared, and the whole discussion of those two days was lost in future work. But in fact, Elizabeth Doyle had been the first to detect what we now call the two-day wave five years before its regular presence in summer was recognised by others. It's in her thesis, but just as a curious observation, but it was in fact the first one. Well, in 1980, a new upward pointing narrow beam radar was constructed at the Buckland Park Field Station under the, uh, the guidance of Professor Vincent for studying uh, the ionosphere and the atmosphere. I realised that this new system could also operate as a meteor radar for measuring meteoroid speeds. And a typical observation is shown in the next slide. <coughs> the upper part of this uh, slide uh, shows some oscillatory features in the amplitude, which up to this point of time were used to measure the speed of the particle across the beam. However, <coughs> but I'm more interested in the lower part of that slide, which is the so-called phase measurement, and around about 500 uh, radar pulses there on the slide, uh, one can look at the data and interpret the phase data in terms of the movement of the particle uh, through, the, uh, through the beam. If, if you now take that information, 
Next slide. You can plot that distance as a function of time. And out of that, of course, you can get a very accurate speed measurement. And this linear relationship was, gave a speed which was five times more accurate than previous measurements and the technique could be applied to about eight times the number of meteoroids. A comprehensive study of the m m main outcomes of this method was carried out by Manuel Severa and once his work was published, this phase method of measuring meteor speeds was adopted by radar meteor groups worldwide. It's continued now as to th this day. Now I must go back 20 years to when Basil Briggs was appointed to the staff. I'm sure Professor Reid will, will present some of his work. But I just want to point out within 12 months of his arrival, he proposed a completely new research program to be set up to study the uh, structures of the dynamics, dynamics of the lower atmosphere with a giant radio telescope thing, which is seen here from on the right from the air. On the left, some idea of the size of it, it was a kilometre in diameter, and those little dots there, there are 89 of them. And the right-hand side, you realise that you, every one of those little antennas there had to be connected up to the main recording station. So we had students who dug trenches and those little white lines, uh, the trenches which carried the cables in which the, carriage, uh, the cables were buried back, carried them back to the main station. Um, it was a fascinating time. You could stand at the main station and you'd see these bodies with a, a, uh, a small earth cutter uh, digging one trench after another um, and those maybe there's somebody here who's actually uh, did that <coughs> well I would re from right from the beginning I realized that this system which operated on two megahertz which is a very low frequency a uh, relatively low frequency as a radar uh, could be used in fact to get scattered back from meteor trails. And the next slide shows the distribution of the heights of meteor observed at two megahertz using this one uh, kilometer array compared with the usual sort of height distributions for most radars. And this work was carried out by um, Dr. Duncan Steele, but there, it was almost 10 years between his appointment and the first observations uh, using this technique, and I just couldn't get anybody interested until I found enough money to actually support a postdoctoral fellow. Duncan Steele was a re remarkable person. You may have heard him over the uh, radio or seen him on the TV uh, and he's promoted a large area of observations of meteors um, and particles in space. Uh, he worked on near-earth objects uh, and he's written a, a, a two or three books. Um, the point of that slide is that you see there are about four times as many meteors observed at two megahertz than at 27 megahertz. And up to that time, nobody really had any clear idea that there were this huge number of meteors, um, meteoroids um, coming into the atmosphere at these higher levels. Um, Well, this information was um, uh, confirmed by some work that I'd been doing with the people at DSTO that related to the interpretation 
of observations with the Jindali over the horizon surveillance radar. They noticed that they were getting excessive number of echoes back, what they thought were fishing trawlers or something out from the Indian Ocean, but turned out to be in fact scattered from meteor trails. Surprising actually to go to a symposium of people, a group of people like this and, uh, out at uh, DSCO that had no idea that you could get radio scattered from meteors. Um, so over two days I was able to correct all that for them. Now that's summarised in the next slide, which shows there uh, a summary of the, <coughs> of the flux of meteoroid particles as observed at the top with satellites, at the bottom visually, and in the middle with radars. Now there's a little offset onto the left group there. They are the observations with the, the radars which we'd been operating until we were able to introduce the two megahertz system and you can see there's the word Jindali there indicates if you take that low frequency data you then have a, essentially a continuum of, of a flux against mass. In the next slide I just want to point out that there's another way of looking at um, meteor trails is to observe them down the, the beam of our radar. Now this is a fairly rare event, obviously. Um, but when you do that, you get on the right there, a uh, record uh, in, at decreasing height levels. And it was uh, Andrew Taylor who realised that from that you could get the... Uh, the speed of the particle coming down the beam. And the remarkable feature was that he was actually able to use that data and measure the speed to an accuracy of about a tenth of a kilometre per second. The next slide shows uh, just an example of his measurements. Uh, as you follow the particle down the beam, and of course increasing time, you can see the speed towards the end of its path decreasing, as you would expect due to collisions with atmospheric uh, air molecules. Finally, the next slide shows what you can do if you take the your data, which we'd been collecting from several years, a typical example in the upper part of the diagram, and on it carry out a mathematical transform called the Fresnel transform, which I realised should show up the structure of the trail um, before that were behind the meteoroid. I did that and to my astonishment it was surprisingly successful. If you look at the amplitude picture there, most people could look at that and think it's covered with noise, all those little fluctuations. That haven't, wouldn't have much meaning. But in fact it's very meaningful when you apply the Fresnel transform you get what is interpreted in the lower part of the slide showing that in fact what's present in that echo is scattered from six trials and we were able to sort them out longitudinally and laterally and the distances are indicated there and with great precision the measurement of the speed of these sets of meteoroids. This is, I think, a most remarkable uh, result. And it's an appropriate place now to reflect on the work of the Adelaide Radar Meteor Group. We started in 1950, we became world leaders in the 60s, and now 52 years later, the present members of the group 
can justly claim that they have retained that position. And after a 52-year love affair with the crumbs of creation, I look back with a sense of nostalgia. <laughs> Sorry, this uh, talk covers a period from 1962 to 1990. Graham has covered uh, an earlier period. This coincides with the appointment of, uh, of Basil Briggs to uh, the department. Before I get into the talk, I just want to note the location of uh, two significant field stations. Uh, St Kilda, the, the uh, station that uh, Graham has mentioned, and Buckland Park, just a little north of Adelaide. Just some... Uh, nomenclature so you know what I'm talking about. I've taken a number of, um, of these images from Basil Briggs' own notes. So the, uh, I compared this with a modern uh, image and the difference is uh, colour. Uh, so the uh, part of the atmosphere we're going to talk, well let's classify the atmosphere according to temperature. We have the troposphere, stratosphere and mesosphere. Then above that the thermosphere where temperatures rise rapidly. And the ionosphere which consists of the D, E and F regions classified according to uh, electron density. So that's the setting the scene. And before we talk about the history starting in 1948, I wanted to talk about some prehistory. So this is J.J. Thompson, and he supervised Ernest Rutherford. There's Ernest Rutherford. Um, those two together supervised uh, Appleton, and there's Appleton. Uh, and all three won Nobel Prizes. In fact, uh, remarkably, seven of uh, Thompson's students won Nobel Prizes, including his son. Um, Appleton supervised uh, J.A. Ratcliffe. And there's a picture of J.A. Ratcliffe. So this is a kind of a genealogy, if you like. Um, and there's Ratcliffe, a fellow of the Royal Society, wrote a number of books. but. From 1927 to 1939, and then from 1946 to 1960, uh, Ratcliffe was at the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge, and the latter period he was regarded as pretty much the number two to brag. He um, was a um, superintendent of the telecommunications research establishment during World War II, and then he um, uh, returned to uh, Cambridge, and from 1960 to 66 uh, he was director of the radar and space research station at Slough. Uh, and the TRE uh, employed uh, something like 6,000 scientists during the war uh, and it's a recurring theme um, uh, as we'll see shortly. Some of uh, Ratcliffe's students in, uh, I've put here include uh, Henry Booker who was a, a giant in radar, uh, Sidney Bowhill uh, from the University of Illinois, uh, Bracewell who was uh, at Stanford and wrote one of the classic texts on Fourier techniques, Basil Briggs, uh, a strong Australian connection here because uh, Palsy uh, studied with um, Ratcliffe. Frederick White, who was originally from New Zealand but ended up pretty much an Australian, and David Whitehead. So these are a few of Ratcliffe's students, and the one uh, we're interested in today is, uh, is Basil Briggs. We've seen this slide before. This is AP Rowe. He was chief superintendent of the TRE during the war. Vice-Chancellor at uh, Adelaide from 48 to 58. And it says, uh, this is from uh, this famous book, it seems that uh, Roe was somewhat of a polarising personality. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, from the book, the ample buildings, this is the university, the ample buildings housed uneven resources with engineering well-equipped and physics a junk shop. So this pretty much baselines physics in 1948. Uh, we then have uh, Huxley, who was... Uh, uh, in charge of the Radar Research School at the TRE uh, and came here as we've heard to become the Elder Chair of Physics and then subsequently the Vice-Chancellor of the ANU. So uh, this is from uh, Bob Compton's uh, historical records. Uh, Huxley found a department starved as a result of the war, both resources and opportunities to appoint new personnel. But he had the advantage of being able to expand his department rapidly as a consequence of swelling student, student numbers and support from an enthusiastic and energetic Vice-Chancellor. So this was a time of growth, uh, lots of uh, money coming in, particularly in the 50s, and the introduction, as we've heard, of the first PhD, so that research could actually be conducted in Australian universities. 
Um, I think I have this, this date wrong, but Graham's been here for so long as an active academic, it's uh, hard to put a boundary on his time here. But uh, here's Graham and here's Basil. Basil, uh, a, a bachelor's degree and a PhD from, uh, from Cambridge and a, and a doctor of science as well. He was a ju junior scientific officer at the TRE during the war uh, and then uh, joined the radio research group at the Cavendish. And then from 1968, um, he was uh, here on staff. So we've heard Graham's story of meteor physics um, and the, the strange term radio physics, which was quite current at the time. I asked uh, Bob Vincent why it was radio physics, and it was to align with the CSIRO division of radio physics and better align uh, perceptions of funding. So it was really something we do now as well. You align yourself with where the money comes from. So Graham uh, joined the department in 1950, as we've heard, and led the development of medial physics. And then Basil joined the group in, in 62, and the group effectively became a radio physics research group uh, under Basil and Graham, encompassed a, a broad range of activities. Uh, that name continued until the mid-1980s, when the name uh, atmospheric physics was adopted. So in the 1960s, radio physics, this curious term, included medial physics, radio astronomy, the atmospheric scattering of laser light, and this is in the 1960s, and ionospheric physics. And here I have uh, one of the uh, somewhat illegible lists that Basil produced regularly for the radio physics group in 1971. A couple of things to point out. These are the assistants, and there are five technicians, and there are four computing assistants. Uh, these are the honours students of the group at the time, and I think there are probably some looking around, there may be some honours, people that were honours students at that time uh, here today, and the research students here. Uh, and quite a, a strong staff as well. I can make it a little bit more legible. These are the research topics of the time for higher degree research students, including a variety of, uh, of topics. And this is, seems to be a characteristic, well, I know. It is a characteristic of the group. It encompassed a wide range of experimental uh, investigations, including some which went nowhere, but others which actually paid handsome dividends in terms of research. So a, a very broad... Um, uh, coverage of experiment, uh, showing some inquiring and first-rate minds, I think. Graham's talked about this. I won't talk again. Just to note, it's June 1952 that full system operation for this radar commenced and meteor work continues today. Uh, a part of the, um, this group, uh, which is perhaps now uh, forgotten, is radio astronomy. And in 1968, Paul Dennison joined the group from Cambridge. Uh, and significant facilities were built uh, to do radio astronomy. Um, these large corner reflector arrays, it's very hard to photograph, but this is in fact an antenna. Here's a, a, a close-up look. Um, Bob reminded me that the deer from the nearby Buckland Park state, um, uh, farm used to get in here because this is full of wires and get tangled up, wreck the antenna and injure themselves in the process, making this quite hard to maintain. But this is actually uh, an area of uh, 2,500 square metres of uh, corner reflectors used for uh, interplanetary scintillation work. There were two other arrays, one at uh, Barrow and one at Kadena, forming a baseline of about 100 kilometres on edge. And using this arrangement, um, the three space sites uh, were used to study the interplanetary scintillation of radio sources in order to derive various parameters of the solar wind, velocity, irregularity, size and so on. Uh, uh, this is a, um, a reference prior to uh, Denison joining the group, but Denison and Hewish, Hewish is the Hewish that won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and this, uh, these arrays were pretty much a replica of what had been built um, at uh, Cambridge by Hewish, uh, and, and very similar to the work which led to the discovery of the pulsar. Uh, Denison left the group in 1973, and although a number of research students continued on uh, and completed uh, PhD theses in this area, um, uh, the group eventually maintaining such a large um, facility spaced over such a large area, the group um, eventually died out. Laser radar, or LIDAR, is another remarkable story. Graham didn't talk about this at all, but I think it's a uh, tribute to him. Um, but this work was initiated in 1963. Well, the first operational laser occurred in 1960. Uh, and this uh, work continued from 63 until 1980. There are a number of PhDs 
completed on this. And I think the motivation was a visit that uh, Graham took to the US on study leave uh, and where it had been claimed that you could use a, a laser, potentially, to look at meteor trails. It turned out that that wasn't realistic, uh, but you could see aerosols quite readily. And this is some of the work from Stuart Young's thesis from a number of years showing aerosol load. The work resumed under Fred Jacker of the Mawson Institute for Antarctic Research. And I should say that the work of the Mawson Institute really complemented the group, uh, this group and a number of other groups in the, uh, in the physics department in these years in the late 1980s. Uh, and measurements were made at Buckland Park uh, between uh, March 1992 and May 1993 by Stephen Ogle. So there's another, like the meteor work, there's a, uh, a line of work or a thread, if you like, that starts in 1963, continues through the 80s. Uh, and indeed, now, uh, this shows the Stephen Argyll's mirror. Uh, some of you may remember Stephen polishing his mirror for two years. Um, and this is the telescope completed at Buckland Park. And I should point out that the continuation of this system, which is like the grandfather's axe, the handle's been replaced and the head's been replaced, but it continues. This uh, laser system is now operational at Davis Station and has been almost continuously since the time it went there. And we're constructing another uh, laser radar system at Buckland Park, and that's a picture there. So another uh, thread that runs from 63 to the present. So ionospheric physics in the 1960s, we have this nice timeline. I should have said that um, I had Bromman Dolman's name on the title slide because she's helped me prepare this talk. Uh, and this is one of the things that Bromman prepared. So in 1962, Basil arrives from Cambridge. Um, in 1962, he also receives a grant from the US Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the University of Adelaide to undertake radio studies of the ionosphere. And this is a time when the US Air Force was particularly inter interested in winds in the upper atmosphere uh, for targeting of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, the grant was about half a million dollars today. Observations commenced in 63 uh, near Salisbury, um, actually at uh, Weapons Research Establishment. And in 1963, uh, Briggs um, proposed the development of this large radio telescope. And Graham was uh, part of the, a key part of the design of that. So it was really Basil and, and Graham together. Um, the Buckland Park field site north of Adelaide was, a, was acquired and initially rented until uh, 1967 when it was purchased for about $200,000. Uh, in 68, um, well, at 67, the array was completed, and I'll show you a few shots of the uh, massive amount of work that went into the creation of this thing. And it is still uh, really intensive uh, in terms of labour to maintain, um, but it is, it is rather unique. And if you think about the, um, what this thing is and uh, the other uh, radio astronomy instrument I showed you, these are really precursors to the square kilometre array in many senses. So, um, I'll talk about this thing here as a piece of the equipment I'll talk about it shortly. Uh, and uh, this 1969, which is a precursor to Duncan Steele's work, um, the first uh, observations of 2 megahertz meteors are made on the system in 1969. So here we have a picture of um, this is one of these stage photos where someone said Graham point at something. So there's Graham pointing at something. There's uh, Basil. Here's a model of the array. Um, and here we have some shots. So this is the array under construction. There are 70 kilometres of coaxial cable buried in the ground. There are 13 kilometres of copper wire strung between these poles, which are the receiving antennas. Uh, and here's a, a cable room. Here is the, uh, the giraffe, which is used to get to the top of these 10 metre poles. Uh, here's the, uh, the giraffe extended. Um, and here are one of those trenches that... Uh, is Neville wild here? And Neville spent a lot of... Is he? Later, or never spent, never a while spent a lot of time digging trenches. Um, first um, paper was published, uh, not the first paper, but a paper in Nature here describing the array in 1969. Uh, here we have a shot of the array from the uh, air and a number of the other parts. Here's a, this is the two, two megahertz meteor, a little bit hard to see. And here is a student, it's probably not allowed anymore, Here's a student working at the top of a pole on top of the giraffe um, repairing antennas. And this is something uh, we've all done. Uh, include, so I look at Bob and I look, at, look around. We've all done this and we used to spend a lot of time on the top of this pole. 
Oh, not that pole on top of that ladder. Um, I should say that this is a tractor which is still at uh, Buckland Park. It's uh, still going strong and it's called Einstein. And it's been there for a very long time. And that's how you tow the uh, giraffe around. Okay, so here's the complete receiving system as of 1967. That sounds like the sounds on. Uh, that hissing is the, uh, shouldn't be there really. All right, so here's the, um, the array. You may just see these crosses here. And this is a shot from, uh, of a radio wave from a transmitter, which is partially, in this case, partially reflected off the ionosphere. And this is uh, time along here. So you can convert the time of flight to a height. And this shows the echo strength. So these are weak echoes. You assume that um, most of the radiation goes straight through and you get a small part back, as many of us are familiar with from many other parts of physics. And this shows um, the fading of the echo and can be interpreted in a number of ways. And it turned out, in the work at Cambridge had shown, that this is because of the drift of a diffraction pattern across the ground. And this shot here shows a diffraction pattern superimposed on the entire array. And one of the reasons this array was built was to sample that ground diffraction pattern and see whether the motion of the pattern could be sampled at a few points to get its overall motion, thus measuring the winds in the upper atmosphere. It turns out that the, uh, for a particular pair of angles, a backscatter, you get a Fourier component on the ground in the electric field, so that the angular polar diagram of the backscatter is the, uh, related to the ground diffraction pattern. In fact, they're Fourier transforms of each other. And in this plot here shows a movie made by Basil, and this is remarkable, 1967, of the ground diffraction pattern moving across the array. And this was done in a, in a rather ingenious way, and I should say that most of the things that Basil did were rather clever in their simplicity, perhaps not in the requirement of the, the way they had to be executed, but the simplicity, the clarity, the description of the physics in terms of physical principles rather than mathematics is quite characteristic of of the training that Basil received uh, in the Cavendish and of, of Ratcliffe and actually runs through the group still. This is the emphasis on the physical interpretation of what's going on rather than a mathematical description. Now this is a diffraction pattern that's moving across the ground and you can see that um, you can see motion perhaps and you can see a lot of randomness as you might expect. The way this was done was that you see this small circular panel here these are receiver banks. There are 89 independent receivers, each connected to an antenna on that large array. Each of those uh, is used to drive a light bulb. So one antenna drives one light bulb. And then there's a ground glass screen that was put across those light bulbs as a diffuser, and you get this uh, beautiful image. Uh, this work kind of work still hasn't been replicated. We have the computational power, but maintaining such a number of receivers and making sure that they're stable and similar is a real challenge. But this is, um, this is still remarkable work. Even more remarkably, we saw this image come up on the pre-presentation, I think. This is Basil and this is Nigel Holmes who worked on this. This big thing here is a stainless steel tank. And here's the tank. And what it actually is, is an analog computer. In fact, it's an analog computer to do, calculate a Fourier transform. It's full of water. And the way this worked was that each of the 89 antennas was connected through uh, a radio receiver to an acoustic transducer. And using the, by cleverly uh, curving the uh, top space, an acoustic lens was formed which produced an image on the bottom, and you got an image transform device. So it took the diffraction pattern and turned it into an image of the thing causing the diffraction. Again, this is F region, so this is about 200 kilometers. On the left hand side, we see the diffraction pattern, and here we have the output from this device here showing the transform of the image. So we see that most of the the turn is coming from a, a spot corresponding to the F region. If you watch it carefully, you'll see the spot move around. And the E region, which is about 100 kilometres, this time only with a focused image, we see 
a number of glints, if you like, showing that this is, these are both total reflections, that means all of the radiation is being returned. The glint moving around uh, on the E region. Again, this work uh, has not been repeated, not in this way anyway, uh, and shows uh, a, a remarkable um, presence in, in the way this device was designed to be uh, remarkably flexible and the continuous extension of its abilities. Right, here's Bob Vincent. Uh, Bob came from uh, the University of Canterbury via Canada and joined the group uh, in 1973. One of the things about the group, uh, when you compare it to other groups uh, in Australia, is that uh, many of the groups which actually came out of the effort in the Second World War were similarly equipped with talented individuals and equipment, um, didn't thrive. The work, uh, they actually effectively disappeared, they evaporated. One of the things Bob brought was uh, an emphasis in uh, looking at the, the D region, below the E region, and extending the work of the group. And this continuous renewal, uh, which, which has occurred and been characteristic of the group in terms of the variety of the things it's being willing to pursue, um, has led to its success. And here are a number of things that uh, Bob has pursued, uh, showing a, uh, a curious mind. So the upper atmosphere work in the 1970s, the array was then turned from ionospheric work to the neutral atmosphere, the D region, between 50 and 90 kilometres. And uh, winds were measured using a new technique pioneered by Bob's supervisor, um, Fraser, in New Zealand. Um, and we see along here a number of other radars which have been installed, one at Woomera, I went to Townsville, one in Morton, Morton Station together with the Morton Institute for Antarctic Research, uh, and uh, finally one down here at Christmas Island. Uh, and at Woomera there were comparisons with falling sphere observations to verify um, the, the fact that the, thing, the winds that uh, were being measured at the time, which were somewhat controversial, were in fact winds. Um, there were a couple of other things. In 1982 we made measurements of uh, the upward flux of um, horizontal momentum, which is, sounds a bit arcane, but I'll come back to that. And Wayne Hocking did significant work on turbulence in the upper atmosphere using this system. Both of these things were unanticipated at the time the instrument was designed. This is again with a large MF array. And here we have, um, I'll come back to that one in a sec. So here we have um, 1985 uh, and the first uh, stratospheric, tropospheric radar in the southern hemisphere being commissioned with uh, Graham and the then VC, Don Stranks and Bob. And this is a, a radar for studying the lower part of the atmosphere, the stratosphere and the troposphere. Here we have the uh, brand new Nova Eclipse computer with this massive bit here, which is five megabytes of uh, disk storage. Uh, and you see Bob is actually typing on a teletype here. <laughs> and we had a tech, um, this, this tech display, which was remarkable because you could do graphics on it. Um, and so this device, uh, it's a coaxial collinear array. It was 100 metres on edge and uh, was used for studying the lowest part of the atmosphere. And the work that Graham referred to, which led to the rebirth of the meteor technique, also occurred on this radar. And Bob uh, reminded me that the impetus for this, uh, the creation of this radar came from study leave uh, that he took in Germany with the Max Planck Institute uh, for Aeronomy. And uh, when you review Graham's career and Bob's career and see um, the, the dividends paid by uh, study leave, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. Zero time? Yeah. I'm almost finished. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of Annette's uh, illustrations of the ST radar. Uh, I just mentioned Wayne Hocking, uh, who did, uh, as I said, and he was another group member, did significant work. Okay, finally, um, the, I mentioned this um, dual beam technique. The, um, it turns out that in, in the early 1980s, uh, models of the atmosphere didn't show this. This is a jet in the upper atmosphere. This is about 80 kilometres, uh, 80 kilometers 60 kilometres. Uh, and computer models just using what was known about the atmosphere then didn't close the jet. Uh, by using the array again in this uh, unusual configuration, uh, Bob and I were able to show that it was actually the divergence, a term, a drag term produced by the breaking of internal atmospheric waves in the upper atmosphere, which closed the jet. This, rate, this put the group in the forefront of thinking in, uh, in theori theoreticians uh, in the world and actually led, led, to, led to a significant rejuvenation uh, of um, the group uh, worldwide. So in summary, um, the work commenced by Basil, Graham, Fred, 
Fred Jacka are involved, continues in some form today, threads are often for more than 60 years, uh, and is still leading edge. That instrument, the large uh, MFH, uh, the BP MFHF large array or radio telescope, continues to be first rate and unique instrument 45 years after it was completed. And uh, just for curiosity, these are, this is one of Joel Younger's plots are showing meteors over Adelaide uh, for one day. You can see the meteors moving around, oh, well, the Earth moving in, as it runs into the, uh, the meteor stream. That's the end, Bruce. Sorry for keeping you from lunch. <laughs>